Hello everyone, uh, Jeremy Dickinson here again, and in this video lecture I'd like to conclude my discussion of Plato's Apology. So this is going to be part five of my video lecture series on Plato's Apology. Now, uh, please excuse the technical difficulty I had with part four, which concluded abruptly. So what I'd like to do now is just pick up where I left off um, there. So part five of my video lecture series is here. And I begin by just recapping a little bit of what I was talking about in 4. Socrates, he has been defending himself, and I think that there's a third stage of defense here that occurs that Plato sets up in the Apology, and that defense really involves thinking about how Socrates was following the command of the God to practice philosophy, and accordingly he didn't live shamefully. Moreover, we learn that Socrates would never cease practicing philosophy because doing so would mean ceasing to strive for virtue. Moreover, Socrates' practice of philosophy involves going around and trying to get other Athenians to care about virtue. Now this is significant because the god had ordered Socrates to go around and practice virtue. Um, and so um, if Athens were to try to stop Socrates from practicing philosophy, Socrates would believe, I should say, would follow the god or the gods instead of Athens. Um, so this would be kind of a case of civil disobedience. Um, were there ever any conflict between the gods' orders and uh, the Athenian orders? So Socrates' mission here seems to be a religious moral one where the god is commanding him to get Athens to care about what really matters what really matters is virtue. That's not to say that worldly success, our bodies, our appearance, and the like don't matter. They just don't matter nearly as much as virtue does. In fact, what Socrates wants to say is that um, virtue is a thing that makes worldly success, appearance, and all the rest um, of value in the first place. So um, money, success, and all the rest, they're only good insofar as they lead to more virtue. So this is, this is all important in terms of defense because we learn who Socrates is really like and what he's really like. And we also learn that Socrates wasn't corrupting the youth. In fact, he was trying to improve the youth by improving Athens more generally by getting them to care about what really matters, namely virtue. And of course, virtue is a state of the soul, a state of the soul, an excellent state of the soul, a state where one is more honorable, more, cur more courageous, more wise, more just, etc., etc., so um, Socrates then moves on from defending himself, he claims. He says that his next uh, defense um, involves defending Athens against itself or from itself. Um, he's no longer in the business of defending himself. He's done what he needs to defend himself. Um, he's um, said that um, he has plenty of evidence um, against his being um, a sophist, um, being someone who makes the weak argument appear stronger um, because he's poor. Um, Sophists went around and they charged money for um, the quote-unquote knowledge that they imparted, the teaching that they gave. And Socrates, he didn't have any money. He was impoverished. He walked around ragamuffin living um, um, very poorly. Um, even though he had a family to take care of, he really followed the God and, and tried to get Athens to care about um, a virtue, and he really neglected his own well-being, which goes against human nature in many ways. And so Socrates has um, has that as a kind of proof that he wasn't a sophist, more where he wasn't a naturalist, an atheist, as we've seen, because he he does he does believe in the gods. Um, now, Socrates' defense against um, his his defending Athens, I should say, against itself depends on the idea that um, so the Athens is about to kill an innocent, an innocent man, and that's an unjust thing. So Socrates, um, consistent with his effort to make Athens care about virtue, um, really wants to try to protect Athens from doing the wrong thing, doing the vicious thing, which is the opposite of doing the virtuous thing, which will lead to corruption, which will lead to badness, um, in Athens. In fact, that's really the only way in which one can be harmed, Socrates seems to suggest. He says, go ahead and kill me, uh, um, disenfranchise me, banish me from Athens. You, you won't harm me. 
Um, you won't harm me because that's not who I am. I mean, I'm not my body. You can harm my body, kill my body, and all the rest, but you can only harm me by making my soul corrupt. The only way you can make my soul corrupt is by making me unjust, by making me vicious. And you can't make me vicious. The only thing that can make me vicious is myself. And so there's a kind of dualism working here, isn't there, in Socrates' is thinking. It's as if he's saying, I'm not my body, I'm not these physical things, I am rather this soul that's untouchable, um, so long as um, I am virtuous. And so Socrates um, wants to say that there, it's not permitted for a better person or for a good person to be um, harmed by a worse person. And the reason for this seems to be uh, something like the gods would never permit it. Uh, later on in the Apology, toward the end, we see Socrates talk about how the gods look after the affairs of the just person. And it stands to reason that the gods look after the affairs of the unjust person in the following way. The gods reward and protect those who are virtuous, and they punish and don't protect those who are, are vicious. It's a kind of view of divine justice that's working in Socrates that we see in other um, worldviews, other religious worldviews, according to which the god or God punishes those who are um, uh, wicked, and God rewards those who are who are, are virtuous or righteous. So that seems to be working in Socrates as well. But um, the key thing here is that Socrates thinks that it's important that Athens realizes what it's doing. It is putting itself in severe harm's way in terms of its own corruption by killing an innocent man. And he wants to have them take a serious thought about this and think about this before they make the decision to have him um, executed. Okay, so that's a, that's a famous table-turning move as Socrates moves away from his defense. But of course, in doing so, we really get a sense, more of a sense of who Socrates is, don't we? We see that he's someone who really champions uh, virtue and he really seems to care about Athens. Um, and what Athens is about to, is about to do. He's concerned about Athens um, um, doing the unjust thing and thus bringing upon itself corruption and, and badness. So um, from here, really, Socrates, he's defended himself. The jury needs to make a verdict. And of course, the verdict is that Socrates is guilty. Maybe I shouldn't say of course, but many people know that Socrates ends up in a lot of trouble. Um, and so he ends up... Um, um, getting a guilty verdict, and it turned out to be closer than he was expecting. So he had some success in convincing some of the members of the jury that he's innocent, but he wasn't able to convince uh, everyone um, and not nearly enough people for him to get off the hook. And this could be, um, by and large, because of those earlier accusers. The accusations were so long-standing, and the children were so brainwashed um, for so long about Socrates that um, now these adult members of the jury who were once brainwashed just can't seem to um, um, let Socrates off the hook. So then both sides, according to Athenian law, um, have the right to, um, to offer a particular sentence for um, the verdict, given that's a guilty verdict, so it's going to be a punishment. Uh, Miletus comes back and says, we want death for Socrates. Socrates comes back and playfully says that um, he's done a great service for, for Athens. He's been a kind of gift from the gods. Um, to, uh, to Athens, and his job has been to stir them up and get them to care about what really matters, get them out of their, their sort of dogmatic slumber, which involves um, not caring about what really matters, namely virtue and the excellence of the soul. Um, so uh, Socrates says that maybe what you should do for me is, is feed me in the Prytaneum, which is where uh, Athens fed the Olympic heroes. Um, but in all seriousness, Socrates ends up saying, go ahead and charge me a fine, one mine of silver, 30 minus of silver. I have friends who will pay them, uh, uh, pay, pay these fines if necessary. And so um, the jury comes back and says, we're going to opt for Miletus, and you are going to get the death penalty, Socrates. And Socrates is like, okay, the death penalty it is. He says, I'm not going to stand up here. I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to whimper. I'm not going to whine. Um, I'm not going to try to pander to the jury for a lesser uh, sentence. I'll take it. Um, but just know that you're not going to be harming me in any way. And you don't even know that death is, um, is, is bad for me. Uh, I should never fear death, he says earlier in the dialogue. But here he says that you, you, know, you don't even know what death brings. Death could bring 
um, uh, afterlife where I get to spend time with um, um, past philosophers and what a nice time that would be for Socrates. And another option is that it's just a dreamless sleep, uh, but maybe forever. Um, a dreamless sleep forever. Uh, not the kind that you wake up from, um, but it could be one that's forever. And if that makes you feel a little interesting, um, where you just sort of, it's a blank forever, um, and it makes you feel like you're standing on the edge of a cliff, well, that's that could be a normal feeling to feel in that circumstance. But anyways, um, Socrates says these things, and at the very um, uh, end of the dialogue, or toward the end of the dialogue, he wants to say that what really matters in life is that we live in an examined life, and the unexamined life is the one that's not worth living. It's one of the most famous passages from all of uh, Plato. Yeah, Socrates say this um, toward the end of the Apology, which means roughly that um, that we have to really reflect and, and examine our lives, not just for the sake of examining our lives. It's, there, there's purpose here, and the purpose is to examine our lives with respect to the amount of virtue that we have in our lives. So we need to constantly be reflective. Are we... Um, living up to our values. Do we have the right values in the first place? Are we prioritizing virtue over other things, over worldly success and, and our jobs and money and all the rest? And and you get a sense that Socrates would say that a life that that doesn't care about these things is just one that um, is, is sort of one for the animals. It's one that is not really um, um, humanly uh, dignifiable, you know, or it's not dignified to live in such a way that we um, don't care about the, the excellence of our souls. And as Socrates um, passes um, time at the end of the uh, at the end of the dialogue, he says to the to the jury, "Look, I go to die, you go to live. Which has the better course? Only the gods know." So once again, he sort of humbles himself um, uh, with respect to claims of knowledge. And this is a common theme through the Platonic dialogues. Um, at least many of them, many of the early ones that we read in Plato, where Socrates seems to be someone who claims ignorance. I don't know. I want to know. I know what um, um, the answers to the big questions can't be because there are logical constraints on our answers and there are conflicts of beliefs when we answer certain ways. Um, so Socrates, he, he, he wants to say that he doesn't know. Um, and and it's his lack of knowledge that puts him in a position where he says, I'm not going to say that, I, that I'm afraid of death, and we shouldn't be afraid of death because we don't know what's going to come. And it's kind of interesting because many think that it's really um, the lack of knowing when it comes to death that gives us reason to, to fear it. But Socrates turns that idea on its head and says, look, we don't know what the future holds with respect to our afterlife or, or being alive after death. So um, we shouldn't fear it. And so Socrates goes, and um, that's really the, the end of the, the defense. So Socrates, he, his defense was unsuccessful, um, at least according to the Athenian jury. And there are obviously other questions that we could raise. Um, is, was Socrates successful ultimately, even though the jury decided otherwise? These are things that an individual has to consider in reading the Apology and perhaps other parts of the Plato corpus that captures Socrates' life so we can say that this was a man who lived in thus and such a way and wasn't guilty of the crimes against him. Um, but, but the apology, by and large, um, seems to give us a picture of a man who was deeply concerned with um, the excellence of one's soul. And I thought that philosophy was all about that. Socrates wanted to claim that really philosophy is about virtue. And, and you're not doing philosophy really until... Um, you focus on really practicing becoming more excellent in the state of um, the state of your soul. Okay, whether or not that's that captures who Socrates exactly was historically, that's another question because you got to keep in mind that lots of these dialogues there is a fictional element to them um, because Socrates takes creative license with them. But I do think there are reason there are reasons to think that so that Plato was trying to capture something authentic about the man Socrates. Um, who ended up being deeply influential in the development of Western thinking and Western philosophy. Okay, so this really concludes my discussion of Plato's Apology. I appreciate everybody uh, listening to the videos and watching the videos. Now, if you have any questions about anything that I've said, be sure to uh, um, ask your questions below. You could always email me at jedickin at syr.edu, and I'll be happy to have a conversation with you about this uh, material that I've covered. There's a whole lot more that could be said. 
but one has to stop someone when we talk about these matters. So again, thanks again for watching. Bye-bye, everybody.